But as you know, the age restriction was only imposed this year as an extra safety measure. And as his name's come off of the goblet, I mean, I don't think there can be any ducking out at this stage. It's down to the rules, you're obliged. Harry will just have to do the best he... <laughs> the door behind him opened again. And a large group of people came in. Professor Dumbledore followed closely by Mr. Crouch, Professor Karkaroff, Madame Maxime, Professor McGonagall, and Professor Snape. Harry heard the buzzing of the hundreds of students on the other side of the wall before Professor McGonagall closed the door. Madame Maxime, said Fleur at once, striding over to her headmistress. They are saying that these little boys to compete also. Somewhere under Harry's numb disbelief, he felt a ripple of anger. Little boy. Madame Maxine had drawn herself up to her full and considerable height. The top of her handsome head brushed the candle-filled chandelier, and her gigantic black satin bosom swelled. What is the meaning of this doubly doll? She asked imperiously. I'd rather like to know that myself, double doll, said Professor Karkaroff. He was wearing a steely smile, and his blue eyes were like chips of ice. Two Hogwarts champions! I don't remember anyone telling me the host school is allowed two champions, or have I not read the rules carefully enough? <laughs> C'est impossible, said Madame Maxime, whose enormous hand with its many superb opals was resting upon Fleur's shoulder. Hogwarts cannot have two champions. It is most unjust. We were under the impression that your age line would keep out younger contestants, Double door, said Karkaroff, his steely smile still in place, though his eyes were colder than ever. Otherwise, we would, of course, have brought a wider selection of candidates from our own schools. It's no one's fault but putters, Karkaroff, said Snape softly. His black eyes were alight with malice. Don't go blaming Dumbledore for Potter's determination to break rules. He's been crossing lines ever since he arrived here. Thank you, Severus, said Dumbledore firmly, and Snape went quiet, though his eyes still glinted malevolently through his curtain of greasy black hair. Professor Dumbledore was now looking down at Harry, who looked right back at him, trying to discern the expression of the eyes behind the half-moon spectacles. Did you put your name into the Goblet of Fire, Harry? He asked calmly. No. Harry was very aware of everybody watching him closely. Snape made a soft noise of impatient disbelief in the shadows. <laughs> Did you ask an older student to put it into the Goblet of Fire for you? Said Dumbledore, ignoring Snape. No. He said vehemently. Ah, but of course he is lying said Madame Maxime. Snape was now shaking his head, his lip curling. He could not have crossed the age line, said Professor McGonagall sharply. I'm sure we all agreed on that. Doubly door must have made a mistake with the line. It is possible, of course, said Dumbledore politely. Dumbledore, you know perfectly well you did not make a mistake, said Professor McGonagall angrily. Really, what nonsense? Harry could not have crossed the line himself, and his Professor Dumbledore believed that he did not persuade an older student to do it for him. I'm sure that should be good enough for everybody else. She shot a very angry look at Professor Snape. Mr. Crouch, Mr. Bagman, said Karkaroff, his voice unctuous once more, you are our uh, uh, objective judges. Surely you will agree this is most irregular. Bagman wiped his round, boyish face with his handkerchief and looked at Mr. Crouch, who was standing outside the circle of firelight, his face half hidden in the shadow. He looked slightly eerie, the half-darkness making him look much older, giving him an almost skull-like appearance. When he spoke, however, it was in his usual curt voice. We must follow the rules, and the rules state clearly that those people whose names come out of the Goblet of Fire are bound to compete in the tournament. Well, uh, Barry knows the rule book back to front, said Bagman, beaming and turning back to Karkaroff and Madame Maxime as though the matter was now closed. I insist upon resubmitting the names of the rest of my students, said Karkaroff. 
He dropped his unctuous tone and his smile now. His face wore a very ugly look indeed. You will set up the Goblet of Fire once more, and we will continue adding names until each school has two champions. It's only fair, Dumbledore. But, Karkaroff, it doesn't work like that, said Bagman. The Goblet of Fire has just gone out. It won't reignite until the start of the next tournament. In which terms, Chung, will most certainly not be competing, exploded Karkaroff. After all our meetings and negotiations and compromises, I little expected something of this nature to occur. I have half a mind to leave now. Empty threat, Karkaroff, growled a voice from near the door. You can't leave your champion now. He's got to compete. They've all got to compete. Binding magical contract like Dumbledore said. Convenient, eh? Booty had just entered the room. He limped toward the fire. Every right step he took, there was a loud clunk. Convenient? I'm afraid I don't understand you, Moody. Harry could tell he was trying to sound disdainful, as though what Moody was saying was barely worth his notice. But his hands gave him away. They had balled themselves into fists. Don't you? said Moody quietly. It's very simple, Karkaroff. Someone put Potter's name in that goblet, knowing he'd have to compete if it came out. Evidently someone who wished to give Hogwarts two bites at the apple. I quite agree, Mother Maxime, said Karkaroff, bowing to her. I shall be lodging complaints with the Ministry of Magic and the International Confederation of Wizards. If anyone's got reason to complain, it's Potter, growled Moody. But, funny thing, I don't hear him saying a word. Why should he complain? burst out Fleur Delacour, stamping her foot. He has a chance to compete, hasn't he? We have all been hoping to be chosen for weeks and weeks. The honor for our schools. A thousand galleons in prize money. This is a chance many would die for. Maybe someone's open Potter is going to die for it, said Moody with the merest trace of a growl. An extremely tense silence followed these words. Ludo Bagman, who was looking very anxious indeed, bounced nervously up and down on his feet and said, Moody, old man, what a thing to say. We all know Professor Moody considers the morning wasted if he hasn't discovered six plots to murder him before lunchtime, said Karkaroff loudly. Apparently, he's now teaching his students to fear assassination too. An odd quality in the defense against the dark arts teacher, Dumbledore, but no doubt you've had your reasons, growled Moody. Same things, eh? It was a skilled witch a wizard who put the boy's name in that goblet. Oh! What evidence is there of that? said Madame Maxime, throwing up her huge hands. Because I had waked a very powerful magical object, said Moody. It would have needed an exceptionally strong confundus charm to bamboozle that goblet into forgetting that only three schools compete in the tournament. I'm guessing they submitted Potter's name under a fourth school to make sure he was the only one in his category. You seem to have given this a great deal of thought, Moody, said Karkaroff coldly. In a very ingenious theory it is. Although, of course, I remember you recently got it into your head that one of your birthday presents contained a cunningly disguised basilisk egg and smashed it to pieces before realizing it was a carriage clock. So you'll understand if we don't take you entirely seriously. And those will turn us occasions to their advantage, Moody retorted in a menacing voice. It's my job to think the way dark wizards do, Karkaroff, as you are to remember... Alaster, said Dumbledore warningly. Harry wondered for a moment when he, whom he was speaking to, but then realized Mad-Eye could hardly be Moody's real first name. Moody fell silent, though still surveying Karkaroff with satisfaction. Karkaroff's face was burning. How this situation arose, we do not know, said Dumbledore, speaking to everyone gathered in the room. It seems to me, however, that we have no choice but to accept it. Both Cedric and Harry have been chosen to compete in the tournament, this, therefore, they will do. Oh, but Dumbledore... My dear Madame Maxime, if you have an alternative, I would be delighted to hear it. Dumbledore waited. But Madame Maxime did not speak. She merely glared. She wasn't the only one, either. Snake looked furious. Karkaroff livid. 
Bagman, however, looked rather excited. Well, shall we crack on then? 